chapter 22 is the fungi of medical importance. So fungi as infectious agents, just like um, microbes, bacterial agents, fungi is the same way. Molds and yeasts are widely distributed in air, in dust, fomites, and normal flora. Humans are relatively resistant to fungal infections. Fungi are relatively non-pathogenic for the most part. Of the 100,000 of the fungal species, only 300 have been linked to diseases in animals. So for the most part, they're innocuous, but the 300 can be very deadly. Fungi are the most common plant pathogens that we have. Human mycoses are caused by true fungal pathogens and opportunistic pathogens. And the difference in how those two react. We have primary or true pathogens. And this is a list we're going to go over each one of these and allow the habit to run this kind of a summary of it. And we also have pathogens with inter intermediate virulence, which is they're kind of cause decay and kind of not as potent as the other ones. And we'll go through those. And the last section is secondary or opportunistic pathogens. Those ones that take over when some patient is immunocompromised or there's trauma to the air or something like that. And they have the an open niche, so to speak, where they can come in and start to invade. <coughs> All right, so those are three different types. We're going to start with fungal pathogens, true or primary fungal pathogens. Those can invade and grow in a healthy, non-compromised host. So in a healthy person, non-compromised, those are the true pathogens that can, that can infect that type of individual. A small number of fungi have the morphological and physiological adaptations to survive and grow in the human body where they experience low oxygen and high temperatures compared to what they have out in the soil, out in the environment, out in the outside world. They have plenty of oxygen, but in the body, it's being used up, oxygen is being used up, so they don't have a lot around, and they're relatively higher temperature than our environment for the most part. So they learn to survive and adapt and grow under low oxygen and high temperature conditions. So they can, they can survive in the human body. The most striking is going to switch from hypho cells to yeast cells. And this is their life cycle. They're the hypho cells in one inside the body and yeast cells in another part of the body. So when they're outside the body, that's your parasitic phase. Hypho cells are your mold phase. So hypho cells are mold and then your yeast. So you, you have mold phase and yeast phase. Okay. Thermodimorphism is the order to grow as mold at 30 degrees and yeast at 37 degrees. So when they're inside the body, they grow as yeast. Okay? When they're outside the body, that's their infection where they can travel from uh, host to host, they're a mold. So they travel as mold, molds and infect the bodies as yeasts. Okay? That's what we call thermal dimorphism, two, two types of morphology. Okay, So here's the hyphae, here's the, the mold stage. Okay, This is when they're outside the body, that's where they grow with plants in the soil. This is their normal phase. When they infect the body, they become yeast. These are yeast infections. So when fungal spores from the environment gain entrance to a warm-blooded animal, like a human, they journey into yeast and remain in this phase in the host. When they leave the host, they go back to the mold stage. Okay? So yeast cells leave the animal host, return to the environment, and revert to this a sporulating hyphosate where they replicate and demonstrate an artificial media in the laboratory. Okay. So a thermomorphism at during temperatures, again, this is 37 degrees body temperature, roughly 25 to 30 degrees centigrade. So thermal dimorphism is a two stage they come into mold in the outside world in the environment when they infect plants, and then uh, yeast when they infect animals. So natural habitat is mold, animal habitat is yeast. So like we said, when fungal spores in the environment gain entrance to a one-blood animal, they journey into yeast and remain in that phase in the host. Yeast cells leave the animal, return to the environment, and this is your mold stage or your hypho, hypho state, same thing. Hypho state is your mold state. That's to live in the environment. Okay, this is where we're going to uh, go over the your fungal pathogens. This is the organism. Okay. Where, where it affects the skin, muscle, and nervous system, cardiovascular, lymphatic, gastrointestinal, respiratory, or your genital. These are all these we're going to go over this time. section. And again, it just shows you the different types of where they affect you. Like the uh, dermatophytes, you're going to learn about ringworm, affecting the skin and skeletal system. 
What about candida albicans? It can be thrush. Okay, we go through all these different systems, it kind of summarizes it. So emerging fungal pathogens. So optimistic fungal pathogens has little or no virulence. Okay, host defenses must be impaired. Okay, in other words, you have to be immunocompromised or some kind of trauma to the body, or there's an area created through antibiotic treatment, something that's let this fungal pathogen have room now to grow. There has to be an impairment somewhere. Okay, so vary from superficial and colonization to potentially fatal systemic disease. So they can be very superficial, but to the skin, very not cause much, or they can be potentially fatal as they go systemically. So an emerging medical concern, which is coming from a problem, is now these, these uh, fungal infections account for 10% of all noscomial infections. So of all infections in hospitals, patients get in the fatal hospital, 10% of them are now fungal infections. Dermatophytes, we're under transformation in true pathogens. Dermatophytes, one response for ring or other disease, which you can type in a little bit here too. Okay, this is uh, comparing true pathogens. Remember, true pathogens do not need immunocompromised host or anything else. They can this on their own. They can infect a healthy, quote, normal host. Opportunistic infections are your secondary infections, okay? They only require some type of area that they can evade, some type of immunocompromised situation. So the degree of virulence, this is very well developed, very high. Okay, this is very limited needs an um, immunocompromised patient. Condition of the host. Resistance can be high or low. For optimistic, it has to be low. There has to be something wrong. Primary port of entry is respiratory. The optimistic can be respiratory or uh, mucosa. Na uh, nature of the infection. This is usually a primary pulmonary systemic, often asymptomatic. You don't even know you have it. Nature of the pulmonary system. Or the, the opportunistic ones vary from uh, superficial skin to pulmonary stomach, usually symptomatic. Okay? Once they invade, they invade because there's a, a breakdown of the body's defense and becomes symptomatic. Nature of the immunity, this is very specific and they're very well developed, can last a long time. The opportunistic are usually weak and short lived because once the body recovers, that fungal infection is fought off. Infecting form is usually conoidal. This is you conoidal or mycelial. We'll go over both those that are going here too. Third so dimorphism we talked about. Highly characteristic between yeast and mold. It's absent. It's only one type and opportunistic. The habitat is usually soil before it goes into the body. And for the opportunistic one, it's soil to flora, plants, and humans and animals. Uh, geographic locations is restricted to certain endemic regions where you have this or the, the fungus present. And in opportunistic, this is distributed worldwide. So this is one of the differences between a true pathogen infection and an opportunistic infection. Okay. Certain types of uh, pathogen we're going to talk about, candida. Okay. It's associated with antibiotic therapy. So when you're creating a, an area where the antibiotics you know, bio, the bacteria are gone, this can happen in that area. Catheters, diabetes, corticosteroids, immunosuppression. Okay. That's for, for candida. Aspergillus is leukemia, corticosteroids, tuberculosis, immunosuppression, IV drug abuse. That's what that one's associated with. Cryptococcus is associated with diabetes, tuberculosis, cancer, corticosteroids, and again, immunosuppression. Okay. Zygomacota species, diabetes, cancer, corticosteroids, IV therapy, and third degree burns. Or these pathogens are associated with as they invade the body. Those are your opportunistic fungal infections. Okay. If something going on, gives it a chance to affect the body. Epidemiology of mycosis. Most fungal pathogens do not require a host to complete their life cycle when infections are not communicable, not spread. Dermatophytes and candida naturally inhabit human bodies and are transmissible. Those are the ones that can spread. Dermoph dermophytosis are the most prevalent of those infections. And the cases can un uh, can can go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed. So true fungal pathogens are distributed in a predictable geographic pattern. There's certain perfect patterns with the, the true fungal infections in the, according to the climate and their soil. You can see where they're located. This is your different types of um, true, path, true fungal infections. You can see where they're grouped together in certain areas. So the portal entry or the pathogenesis of fungi, how they get in. Primary mycoses 
are your respiratory portals. They're inhaled spores. Okay, they can get it by subcutaneous inoculation under the skin or through trauma, breaking the, the primary defense, like breaking the skin. It could be cutaneous or and superficial contamination of skin surfaces. Okay, the virulence factor, thermodimorphism. Let me talk about that. Toxin-like substances, capsules and adherence factors, hydrolytic enzymes, and inflammatory status. All those factors determine the virulence factors of this fungi. So host antifungal defenses. How we fight against fungal infections? The integrity of the skin, mucous membrane, and our respiratory cilia. Okay, the, 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 uh, the skin being intact helps prevent entry. Mucous membranes all being intact prevent entry. And our cilia help prevent any respiratory, any spores we breathe in, inhale, inhale, inhale. Okay, helps bring those, helps bring those out of the body. Most important are cell mediated immunity. That's our B and T cells. Digocytosis, the ability of the, the T cells to dissolve or eat or consume pathogens and inflammatory responses. Those are most important antifungal defenses. Long-term immunity can only develop for some true pathogens. Uh, once they're there, they have the antigen on the surface and we can develop immunity to them. So which phase of fungal life cycle is best adapted to growing in a host body? Remember, hypho is your mold. Same thing. So which is a fungal infection? Uh, which phase? What is the phase inside the host? The phase is yeast, right? That's the phase a fungal infection is in when it's in the body, so the thermodimorphism. Okay, yeast is in the body, mold is outside the body, back in the environment or soil. So the phase of fungal best adapted to going in the host body is going to be in the yeast phase. Okay. Diagnosis of mycotic, uh, mycotic infections. It requires microscopic viewing of stained specimens, culturing in selective and enriched media to tell which type of fungal infection, fungus uh, type it is, Specific biochemical and serological tests are also used. You can see a difference under the microscope and see that you can identify certain types of the, back of the fungus. This isolates different fungal infection, you have the different wells. This is a sample plate. You put it in the matrix, you mix it in, and you in in inoculate each plate, which has a different um, media in it. You expose it to, to lasers or a detector, and you can tell which type of fungal uh, species that, that you have in the infection. Okay, immunization is usually not effective with fungal infections, not like bacterial, not like influenza, like a virus. Workers present vaccines for uh, coccidiodimycosis and histoplasmosis. Prevention limited to masks and protective clothing to reduce contact with spores. That's what we usually use protection. Use. That's what we've got. We don't have a vaccine for it for fungal infections. Some cases, surgery removal of damaged tissue is required in those infections. You see some good examples of how they can affect the body. So control uh, characteristics of antifungal drugs. These are drugs used to combat or fight fungal infections. Okay, we use the plasma membrane, being intact, helps prevent it. Polyenes, amphotericin B and nystatin. These are two real big ones. Amphotericin B is very toxic and nystatin, these are both very toxic antifungals. Amphotericin B is highly toxic, but most effective for treating life-threatening infections. When you, you've got to hear what big drugs you got, that's what you use. Nystatin, you cannot use systemically. It's too toxic. You can't give that inside. Nystatin is a rinse or uh, topical. Okay, it's used. Um, we use Nystatin in dentistry with uh, using patients that were dentures in nursing homes. The dentures are taken off, and not cleaned very well. They get fungal infections on the denture itself, and fungal infections that spread to the Mucosa of the oral cavity. We'll use nice standard rinses to go after that fungal infection. Azoles, you have imidazoles and triazoles. Okay. Uh, Ali lamelines, we have the different types, lamicil and naphtaphene. Okay, and both taken orally. Cell wall helps prevent uh, fungal infections. The different types of uh, ecocandidins, caspofungin, et cetera, those are used to block the synthesis of polysaccharide of the cell wall in many pathogens and fungi. We have drugs that stop the cell division, and we have drugs that interact with nucleic acid synthesis of the fun for fungal infections. Okay, so the ones for the cell division are used to treat skin and nail infections. They concentrate the dead keratinized layers of the skin, acting as fungi that invade these keratinized cells. 
I'm talking about different types of ringworm and stuff that can invade those keratinized cells. And then we got the nucleosma used for systemic yeast infections, which is it is an enzyme required for nucleotide synthesis. It's not effective against most molds. Nice. Mycosis versus enin, okay, according to the type, level of infection, and degree of pathogenicity. So true pathogens. Systemic, cutane, cutaneous, and superficial mycoses are all found. Opportunistic mycoses can be systemic, right? but they have to have that immunocompromised patient for them to take effect, take hold. This is the, the layers of skin, how the uh, fungal infection will affect. You have the, the depth of your layers. You have your epidermis, which is your top layer, your stratum corneum, which is your layer just below where the epidermis and the dermis meet. This is a thick layer here, your basal membrane, remember from anatomy, this is your stratum corneum, one of the layers there. Then you have, you have your epidermis, your dermis, and your, your hypodermis or subcutaneous. Same thing, uh, sub Q is your subcutaneous, which is same thing as hypodermic. That's you get the term hypodermic needle. It enters into the hypodermic tissue here, it goes through the epidermis and the dermis. So this is how it's organized. This is the skin is attached structure and many potential sites for invasions. Okay, including the scalp, smooth skin, the hair, and mucous membranes. So differing depths of involvement are superficial, consisting of extreme shallow epidermal in the epidermis, colonization, cutaneous, involving the stratum corneum, okay, in the case of the upper dermis, and subcutaneous, okay, occur after a puncture wound. Okay, has been introduced the fungus deeper into the subcutaneous tissue. That's when it goes into the hypodermic. That's when it goes into this level right in here. That's where a needle injects into your hypodermic needles. In a systemic deep mycosis, the fungus disseminates from the lungs or other sites into the circulation. Fungi, fungi, fun, uh, fungemia leads to infection of the brain, kidneys, and other organs. So it can perhaps just send out the body once it's introduced deeply into the, into the subcutaneous layer. Systemic infections by true pathogens. These are restricted to endemic regions of the world where the, where the endemic, uh, endemics break out. Infection occurs when matter containing conidia is distributed. Spores germinate in the lungs. Infection can become systematic. Spores may be inoculated into the skin. All diseases result in immunity from true pathogens. They have a long-term setup. They have antigen exposures and we get immune reaction to them. His, uh, histoplasma capsulatum, which is a Ohio Valley fever, is the most common true pathogen, and it causes histoplasmosis. This is typically dimorphic, distributed worldwide, most prevalent in the eastern and central region of the U.S. This usually grows in moist soil, okay, high in nitrogen content, and below 35 degrees. Okay, so how Ohio Valley fever, histoplasmosis, it's inhaled conidia, okay, produce a primary pulmonary infection that may progress to systemic involvement of right organs and chronic lung disease. Okay, the treatment, undetected amount of cases resolve with no treatment, they resolve on their own. Okay, systemic chemotherapy for chronic cases, amphotericin B, remember that one, and itraconazole or surgery to remove the disease part. This is what it looks like uh, on microscope, Histo, uh, histoplasmosis or high, high valley fever. You can see the mold growing. This is a histoplasmosis. You have the soil containing bird droppings lifted by the wind. Microchondria are now inhaled. Okay. Patient with mild uh, pneumonitis, which might reoccur. You can see the yeast cells and it brought into the lung and the tissue, and then they multiply and then they bud back out and repeat the cycle. And they can invade other, other tissues, other organs. Okay, so the soil containing the bird drop in his head is whipped up by the wind. The microchondria are inhaled. Patients develop mild pneumonitis, which can reoccur. So in the tissue phase of infection, the yeast phase develops. Right? The yeast phase develops inside the body at 37 degrees. The yeast say is phagocytized, so it's brought into the cells, multiplies by budding intracellularly, and most patients recover from this without complications. In some cases, the phagocytes enter the blood it causes disseminated disease in a number of different organs. And that way it spreads systemically. Um, coccidioides imidis causes 
This is Kaku pneumonia mycosis. It's a block-like afferent condia in free living state. So spherules contain endospores in your lungs. And this lives in alkaline soils, okay? in semi-arid, so kind of hot, semi-dry climates. It's endemic to the southwest United States. So Cochondioides imitis, okay, remember, it's in, it lives in alkaline soils, in semi-arid areas, in semi-arid climates. Uh, Coxodiodiomycosis, mycosis, uh, mycosis is a valley fever. Okay. Atherospores inhaled from dust creates uh, spherules in the lungs that release the spores in the lungs. Infection may, be, uh, infection may develop into infection of the skin, into the bones, and in the central nervous system. In chronic pulmonary disease, we get nodules formed in the lungs called fungal mass. Those are nodules that affect from the lungs. The treatment is amphotericin given IV. And this is valley fever. You can see the lesions on the skin. The continuous lesion services are uh, coxodiodes infection and coxodiodomycosis. This is how it spreads. You see it goes from the soil and the anthospores into the lungs and then phagocytosis and into the cells, completing the cycle. Okay, and that cycle is you're digging in the soil, produces aerosols or anthospores. Okay, the inhaled atherospores establish your lung infection. Atherospores develop into uh, spherules that produce endospores and they're released into your lungs. Immunocompetent persons effectively fight the infection and return to health. Compromised people, immunosuppressed patients, okay, can develop meningitis, osteomyelitis, and skin granulomas, like you saw. Meningitis affects the brain, osteomyelitis affects the bones. Okay, the test for this disease, you put it on a different one, you have the antigen, and you have the patient's serum, how it reacts to the antigen. You have a, uh, two controls. So you see your controls right here, and these are your patient's serums right here. And how they respond to the, this is your antigen. This is what they're going to respond to. Uh, blastomyces dermatitis causes blastomycosis. Okay, this is dimorphic. Mold, uh, mold to yeast. Free living species are in the soil of large sex in the Midwest and southeastern United States. As it looks like under a microscope, you see the, the blastomyces is being formed here from the uh, yeast infection. And it's inhaled 10 to 20 conidia, convert to yeast, and multiply in the lungs. Symptoms include a cough and a fever, chronic cutaneous bone and nervous system complications. Especially through the uh, nervous system and especially the bone, osteomyelitis and uh, a meningitis. The treatment, amphotericin B okay, and azole drugs. And you can see the lesions that those produce. That's a, it's a blastomycosis. Okay. Paracoxidoides, brassolensis, is a dimorphic fungal pathogen. Okay, mold and yeast distributed in Central South America. Lung infection occurs through inhalation or inoculation of the spores under the skin. Systemic disease is not common. The skin, the head mucous membranes, lymphatic organs might also be infected, and the treatment. Most cases are benign and unnoticed. They don't treat them. In disseminated cases where it gets systemic and spreads throughout the body, ketoconazole, amphotericin B, and sulfa drugs are used to treat or a combination of those. Okay, the primary reserve for coxiodes imitus is what? Okay, remember, chronic hair is what he was about. Remember, it came from semi arid environments in the soil. So it would be the dry soil. That's where coxiodes imitus is usually found. That's its primary reservoir. It's in the dry soil. So subcutaneous mycoses below the skin. Subcutaneous mycoses. When fungi transfer directly into a traumatized skin, they can invade the damaged site. They can get into the hypodermic layer of the subcutaneous layer. Most species in this group are, are greatly inhibited by higher temperatures of the blood and viscera. Diseases are progressive. Mycosis category are, are, are sporotrichosis, chromatoblastomycosis, uh, hypomycosis, and mycetoma. Okay. Uh, sporothrix key. This is rural gardener's disease. It's very common to have a fungus that decomposes plant matter into soil. Causes of sporotrichosis. OK, 
Okay, it infects your appendages, your arms and legs, and your lungs. Lymphocutaneous variety occurs when contaminated plant matter penetrates the skin and the pathogen forms a nodule. This nodule then spreads to nearby lymph nodes and affects the lymphatic system. This is what they look like under the microscope. You can see like with the like the like the flowery pattern of like Rose Gardner's disease. And this is what it looks like on the skin. Very, very nasty skin infection. Okay. Chromoblastomycosis and fail hypomycosis. Chromoblastomycosis is progressive subcutaneous mycosis, characterized by highly visible verrucous lesions. Verrucous is Latin for wart like. Um, verrucous carcinoma on the lip. You'll see our patients, those are the patients, you'll see that in patients that chew tobacco. Okay, they have those white lines and all those lesions that look kind of wart like, it's called verrucous carcinoma. So, verrucous means kind of wart like appearance. So it's a verrucous lesions. The etiological agents are soil saprodes with dark pigmented mycelium spores. Okay, cause from forcing kea uh, pedrosi, filiforia verrucosa, a cladosporium carioni. Produce very large, thick yeast-like bodies. Okay, sclerotic cells. Because it's in that, that wart-like appearance. Uh, Phaeo hypho uh, mycosis. They remain uh, typically hypho. Hypho means mold-like, remember, your hyphal is mold. Etiological agents are soil fungi or plant pathogens with brown pigmented mycelium because they're in the mold when they're in the, the plant pathogens when they're back in the soil. That's when they're in mold stage, back when they're made by human body, they become yeast. Uh, you have the different, the different, bacteria, the different uh, fungi that cause it. Often creates crusty skin lesions and abscesses. Deeper forms disfiguring cysts that have to be surgically removed. In compromised patients, the fungi can spread into the bones, the brain, and the lungs in immunocompromised patients. Uh, mycetoma, when soil microbes are accidentally implanted into the skin, progressive tumor disease of the hand and foot due to chronic fungal infections may lead to loss of the body, pot, body part if this infection keeps going. Caused by pseudoalisuria or madorella. Uh, okay, you can see the infection in the foot, and you can lose a good part of your foot due to those infections. You can see the invading uh, spirochetes under the surface of the skin, under the epidermal layer. Cutaneous mycosis, infection strictly confined to keratinized epidermis, the skin, the hair, and the nails. So cutaneous mycosis are to have to find a keratinized epidermis, which is your thick skin. They don't forge your mucous membrane. They go on the, the keratinized surfaces of the epidermis, okay? They affect the skin, the hair, and the nails, and they're called dermatophytosis, which is ringworm and tinea. There's 39 species in this genre, closely related and morphologically similar. Causative age of ringworm varies case to case. What causes this dermatophytosis is it varies from case to case. This is the contains mycosis. You can see the different types of mold. Also, close above, you see different types of uh, fungi infection. Cutaneous mycosis, natural reservoirs are humans, animals, and soil. Okay. The hardiness of the dermatophyte spores, presence of abraded skin, and intimate contact promote infection. Okay. Long infection periods followed by localized inflammation and alert your reaction to fungal proteins. Those are your antigens. Okay. This is a summation of the genre and the disease. So the genus is uh, trichophyton. This is your ringers of the scalp, body, beard, and nails. This is athlete's foot. Microsporum, ringer of the scalp and the skin. Epidermophyton, a ringer of groin and your nails. Okay, these are the targets that it attacks and how it transmitted. This one is human to human or animal to human, animal to human or soil to human, human to human. And this one is only transmitted Ring of the, of the groin nails is only transmitted human to human. So the pathology of dermophytosis, ring of the scalp is tinea capitis, affects the scalp and hair bearing regions of the head. Hair may be lost in that area. Ringworm of the beard, tinea barbea, affects the chin and beard of adult males, contracted mainly from animals. Ring of the body, tinea corporis occurs in flamed red ring lesions anywhere on smooth skin. 
So tinea capitis, tinea barberi, and tinea corpus. You can see the scalp infection. You can see the side of the head. infection on the side of the face. It's going to occur under the skin. So ringworm of the, the groin is tinea cru uh, cruis, which is what terminal is jock itch, affects the groin and the scrotal regions. Ringworm of the nails is tinea unguli unguium, persistent combination of the nails of the hands and feet. Those are what distort your nail beds. And ringworm of the foot is tinea pedis, and the hand, tinea manu, manu, manu okay, spread by exposure to, the, from, to public surfaces, occurs between the digits and on the soles of your feet. Okay, although symptoms are so dramatic and suggestive, in most cases, microdenations and culturing are, are needed to make a final, uh, final diagnosis. The treatment, topical antifungal agents, Tolnafet, Mycanzyl, are applied for several weeks, or Lamisil, or Grethofilvin, is applied one to two years of treatment. General debris in the skin, some UV light treatments can sometimes have some beneficial in treat, benefit in treatment. Superficial mycosis, tinea, fusi color, caused by malassezia furfur, elicits mild chronic scaling, modeling of the skin, also implicated in folliculitis, psoriasis, and seborrheic dermatitis. White piedra, caused by trichosporin uh, begeli, these white colors mass develops uh, scalp, pubic areas, or axillary hair. Black piedra, caused by piedra horte. Dark brown to black greedy nodules, mainly on the scalp hairs. You can see the dark brown on the scalp hairs. You can see the pattern along the back. So derm uh, dermatopic fungi attack, the blank in the blank. The epithelial cells in the lungs, they attack the melanin cells in the stone corneum. They attack the keratin in the skin, nails, and hair, or they attack the bone in the foot. Remember to attack the, the dead cells of the thicker portion of the body or the keratin. And it attacks either the skin, the nails, or the hair. So it should be C. Yep. Opportunistic mycocosis. All have predisposing factors. These are ones that take advantage when you have an immunocompromised or utterly altered patient. You have candida, which is the dominant opportunistic pathogen. Aspergillus accounts for most of your lung infections. Cryotococcus, Alternaria, Pelsillomyces, Fusarium, Rhizopus, and Toropopsis. Candida albicans. This is a widespread yeast. Can you see the word yeast? You know it is in the body. You just pull out if it's, if it's a thermal diaphragmatic. These infections can be short-lived, superficial skin irritations, to overwhelming fatal system disease. So you can have some super, you can have some skin irritations from a yeast infection, or they can be fatal as they get your entire body. Budding cells of varying size that form both elongate pseudohyphae and true hyphae, from off-white pasty colonies okay, with a yeasty odor. Okay, normal floor of the oral cavity, genitalia, large intestines or skin, uh, skin of 20% of humans. That's where they're found. They have normal floor. They normally occur in your oral cavity of the mouth. Genitalia and large intestines are kept under control by your immune system and by the presence of other bacteria. That's when we treat people with bacteria with antibiotics, making a yeast infection because it can take over that area where the bacteria were that we now killed off. Volvo vaginal yeast infection is painful type of condition of the female genital region that causes ulceration and discharge in the vaginal area. This can be caused by antibiotic treatment. Penicillins, clindamycin, things like that. They wipe out the good bacteria and the yeast, the uh, candida albicans now takes that area over. It's an opportunistic, opportunistic yeast. Okay. Cutaneous candi uh, candidiasis in chronically moist areas of the skin and burn patients and thrush, thrush we see in the mouth. It's a thick white adherent growth of the mucous membranes of the mouth and the throat. That's thrush. You can see thrush here. See it forming on the mucous membranes on the lips. And again, treat that with nystatin, but not nystatin pills, it's too toxic for that. Nystatin as a topical, as a rinse. Uh, treatment can night, presumptive diagnosis made of budding yeast cells and pseudohyphae are found. Okay. Growth on selective differential media, differential different candida species, by what media they grow in. 
The treatment of superficial infections are topical antifungals like azoles and polines. Polines are your uh, nystatin and your amphotericin B. Systemic infections, amphotericin B and fluconazole. Okay, you see the yeast that are forming and these little bud infections that keep bringing. These are diagnostic of candida albicans, candida infections. Okay. Diagnosis, is, it looks like a little pillbox, but the little wells and the different uh, agar in each one of the different wells, different media. And depending how well it grows, if there's in color change, and you can compare the colors and determine what type of, of uh, can, and candiasis is present. Uh, Cryptococcal neoformans is widespread encapsulated yeast that inhabits soil around pigeon roosts. Cryptococcus is a common infection of AIDS patients, cancer patients, and diabetes patients, all because they have a suppressed immune system. Okay. Infection of the lungs leads to cough, fever, and lung nodules. Dissemination to the meninges and the brain can cause severe neurological disturbance and death. Maybe the meninges protect the cerebral spinal cord, which goes around the brain, and that's around the cerebral spinal cord, all three layers the dura matter, the erecta matter, and the pia matter. Those are your three layers of meninges that protect and surround your brain and spinal, central nervous system. Okay. Fungal infections get that, and they can disrupt it, disseminate through there, and they can cause severe neurological problems and eventually death. Okay. And you can see the Cryptococcus neoformis there, and here are the lesions that are found on the skin surface. Now the crypto, uh, cryptococcosis, our negative strain demonstrates encapsulated budding yeast. Those are diagnostic ones. Biochemical tests, your lot testing also confirm it. DNA probes make a positive genetic identification. Systemic infections require amphotericin B and fluconazole. Okay, pneumocytis uh, gerbecki, pneumocytis pneumonia. They're small unicellular fungus that cause pneumonia. Okay. The most prominent opportunistic infection in AIDS patients. That's what most AIDS patients die of, is this fungal pneumonia. Okay. This pneumonia forms secretions in the lungs that block your breathing. Okay. It be rapidly fatal if not controlled with medication. Okay. Remember, you get secretion in the lungs. If you get any kind of secretion in the lungs and you can't get it out because your immune system is compromised, you're going to drown in your own tissues because you can't get oxygen across the water barrier, liquid barrier. Primary treatment is asulfamethazole and trimethoprim. Uh, pentamidone and aerosol form is also given as a prophylactic measure in patients with low T cell counts, just like in AIDS patients. Low T cell counts, you're immunocompromised. Okay? They can give you uh, pentamidine in, as a, pre a preventative measure to prevent this fungus from taking over causing pneumonia. This is what it looks like. You can see the Fungal, the fungal cells there budding, budding off of the yeast infection. Aspergillosis, disease of the genesis, aspergillus. It's very common airborne soil fungus. 600 species, eight of those species are involved in human disease. Aspergillus um, fumigatus are most infectious fungus. Serious opportunistic threat to AIDS patients, leukemia patients, and immunodeficiency or immunosuppressed patients. It's also involved in allergic reactions and toxopsychosis. Okay, this is what the aspergillus looks like. You can see the, the yeast. You can see the different budding chains as this forms along it. Aspergillosis is a disease, of the, a disease caused from it. Its infection usually occurs in the lungs. The spores germinate in the lungs and form fungal balls, like you saw in the previous picture, and they colonize. And they can colonize in your sinus cavities, your ear canals, your eyelids, and your conjunctiva. Okay, invasive aspergillosis can produce necrotic pneumonia, an infection of your brain, your heart, and other organs. You can spread systemically. Treatment, non-invasive, non-invasive treatment is surgical or local drug therapy of the lung using vorconazole, Crizemba is a new uh, azole drug, or amphotericin. Systemic, disease, uh, systemic treatment, we combine drug therapy of those different types. And you can see, you can see the infection in the lungs. See that mass coming through your lungs right in there. Mycosis, also known as zygomycosis. Zygomycota are extremely abundant uh, saffronic fungi in the soil, in the water, organic debris, and food. The genre was often involved with uh, rhizobus, absidia, and mucor. Usually, 
which is usually harmless air contaminants, invade the membranes of the nose, eyes, heart, and brain of people that have diabetes or have malnutrition, and it results in severe consequences once it gets in. But it's an opportunistic pathogen. And you can see how it buds on and grows with the different colonies there. And you can see the skin lesions that it causes. Miscellaneous opportunists. Okay, any fungus can be implicated in infections when immune defenses are compromised. Geotrichum candidum causes uh, geotrichosis, which is a mold found in soil, dairy products, primarily involved in secondary lung infections. Fusarium species from, from the soil occasionally affect your eyes, toenails, and when you have burned skin. Okay, you see the budding, you see the yeast as it's growing in the body. Fungal allergies and intoxications. Fungal spores are common sources of atopic allergies, seasonal allergies and asthma, farmer's lungs, tea picker's lungs, bark stripper's disease. Those are fungal are, are seasonal allergies and asthmas. Fungal toxins lead to mycotoxicosis, usually caused by ingesting or inhaling the fungal toxins. Aflatoxin toxic and uh, aflatoxin toxic and carcinogenic, okay? grains, corns, peanuts, lethal to poultry and livestock. Starchy botrols, charterum, are sick, it is all called sick building syndrome, severe hematologic and neurological damage. Which of the following cause of agents causes oral thrush? What causes all the white patches in the mouth? That's normal in the mouth, can overcome because there's immunodeficiency. Candida albicans, normally found in the mouth, and you can get thrush, especially when you're exposed to antibiotics that kill the normal flora now, and now the candida albicans can take over. And that's thrush, candida albicans. 